four of the RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. RSA is an accessible, collaborative organization that fosters innovation, education, and advocacy for residents and students in emergency medicine. In this episode, Dr. Ashley Alker, resident at University of California, San Diego Medical Center, and current RSA at-large board member, speaks with Dr. Dara Cass, assistant professor at FEMINEM. Today, Dr. Alker and Dr. Cass will discuss FEMINEM and gender equality in emergency medicine. Hello, I am Ashley Alker. I am UCSD resident and the advocacy chair on the AAEM RSA Board of Directors. I am here with Dara Cass, the creator of FEMINEM. Dara, can you tell us a little bit about your background? My whole background. Well, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. I, uh, so from FEMINEM's perspective, I was a resident at Kings County in New York City. And then I was an attending at Staten Island University Hospital, where I started doing a lot of education and residency program development, stuff like that. I had a couple of kids and then a third from the time that I started being an attending through the next five years. And I was very involved in social media and education. So a lot of the core so the counselor residency directors initiatives on how can we open the access of education and increase knowledge translation. And one of the things that I realized being involved in the women's groups as I had become more advanced in my career was that we were not very good at communicating the journey of the women physicians in emergency medicine to each other. So for example, if somebody was writing an article in a newsletter, let's say for the women's group for SAM, AWEM, or AWEP, which is the women's group for ASAP, we would read it and we would understand their journey and we would be part of it. And then we would write back how we could change things, what we needed to do. And then it would go nowhere, right? That conversation would happen between five people that were involved in the group and nothing would come of it. And it wasn't for lack of trying. It was just that the network wasn't there the same way outside of that group. And so we kind of said, well, what if we could take the same principles of open access communication and, you know, knowledge translation and apply it to women's development, which is exactly what Feminem is, right? It's a open access resource for women in emergency medicine that allows us to share content, to advocate for issues related to the wellness, but more importantly, the career development of women. And it really is true to its purpose as FOAM is. So if you look at Feminine, we really try to be honest about who we are and our difficulties, but more importantly, our privileges. And we don't ask for a lot of concessions. We don't make any apologies. We very much just talk about the state of affairs and what we think needs to change in the long term for the careers of women in our field. Well, as a woman, I feel privileged to have FEMINEM exist. Can you tell us what inspired you to create FEM in EM? Well, I mean, I think that that kind of idea of there being no place to park the issues related to women in emergency medicine consistently, that wasn't somehow governed by an overarching organization. So one of the things that's important to recognize is that each of our major organizations has a purpose, has a responsibility, and is generally suited for a specific part of what we do. And that's okay, because they are really good at what they do. And the women's group generally reflects those needs. So in AWEM, it's about the academic needs of women physicians. In ASEP and AWEP, it's much more about the policy and the professional development of women in their careers and options. And so at AAM, it's a little bit more about the advocacy and the fairness of the job place, but everything is a different silo. And Feminem, when we decided to do it, we were going to be free of that overarching policy commonality of the group and be able to do everything. And that's a lot of what I think our magic sauce is, is that we can toggle between academic conversations around a paper that comes out on gender and grand round speaking, and then talk about the workplace and salary discrepancies for women, and then talk about somebody getting fired for gender discrimination and advocating for them that way, and toggle between the needs of all of these groups, but still be true to the single theme we have, which is creating a conversation around gender equity in emergency medicine. Definitely. What do you think the most important challenges for women in emergency medicine are today? And where would you like to see positive change? So I think that the most important challenges for women in emergency medicine are actually much less specific to emergency medicine and much more about the careers of women and men in the future. I think that when we look at the challenges of women professionals, I've had this conversation even here at AAM with people on the side, we added women into the workplace. And I mean that exactly as it sounds and then expected the job that they were previously doing in society to get done on the side. 
And there's no such thing as side care for children or side care for a family or side care for your parents or side care for yourself. And so women in the workplace, the conversation includes how do we create the space for the other jobs that women were traditionally doing? And also, how do we create the space for men to do those jobs too? So a lot of what we want to see in the future, the biggest impact I hope Feminem has is about creating the space for conversations for things that women have to do, right? Women have to have the babies. Women have to take maternity leave. Women have to nurse. But also, we need to create an advocacy role for paternity leave. We have to create a space where men in our specialty feel empowered to say, my kids need me too. I mean, I sit on these panels or I sit in these lectures and I see all these men who I looked up to for my whole career. And when they reflect back on their own careers, their academic achievements are incredible. They have written books. They have given lectures. They're names that you could drop out of a room and everyone would fall over those names. And then you ask them about their biggest regret. And one of the things that they almost universally say is, I just wish I got to spend more time at home with my kids. Somebody once said that he was talking about on a panel looking back at his life. And he said that he was always excited that he made it to every one of his kids' plays. Because his kid was in theater or whatever it was. And he always got there just in time for his child to give their part. And he walks in and he always sees his child like scanning the room waiting for him to get there. And he knows he just got there in time and it's a victory. And then 15 years later, he realized it was a defeat. Because for the like 30 minutes or an hour that the kid was on stage, the kid wasn't paying attention to the play. They were just looking for their dad in the audience. And it's a perspective that we all need better balance and we all need better opportunities. And gender equity is about all of us. It's not only about women. And I think that that's the biggest positive change I want to see around this conversation is that it's about giving everybody the options that's right, that are right for them. Great. You had mentioned maternity leave on that topic. What are your thoughts on maternity leave for EM residents and for faculty? So they're two totally different topics because of their employment status. I think that for men and women residents, the problem with maternity leave or any real leave during residency is that you have to complete a certain amount of training and there are overarching governances that determine your time for the period of time you're a resident. And that there's also contracts and you provide staffing to the hospital. And there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle about I'm just going to take some time off and give birth to my kid and be home. And one of the things that we are really bad at as women who are generally overachievers, but even men, all of us who go into medicine, who seek our careers in a linear fashion is we expect to start and stop at a very prescribed period of time. And we expect that everything we're going to need to do is going to fit within that algorithm. And as educators, we're also pretty bad at accepting that not every journey is the same length. We're just getting there in education. We're just getting there in residency length to say, well, maybe every resident doesn't learn at the same pace and people can't achieve their milestones at the same rate. But we also need to realize that if somebody takes three months, six months off to be a parent for a period of time and then come back to residency, that's not a blight on the record. Now, it's also not a benign ask of the residency. We have to staff our departments and take care of our patients. But we as professionals and residents don't even come into the conversation half the time because we're so ashamed of the concept that there might be more time we need for something else besides medicine in that moment. For residents and maternity leave and paternity leave, and I think that one of the stories I tell about the worst day of my life as an advocate for gender equity was when I walked into the ER and I saw one of my residents 24 hours after his wife had given birth in the ER. And his paternity leave was scheduled to start the next week because she had delivered early. And his baby was under billy lights or something and she was still in the hospital. And I was so upset that the system had failed him. And really, the system hadn't failed him because it wasn't set up for success. He wasn't supposed to be anywhere but where he was. And so I think that we all need to be more dynamic about how we approach childbirth in our residents. We're seeing, obviously, and I think it's a great thing, a much higher increase this year. We're going to see more women match in emergency medicine than we've ever seen before, based on my own personal calculating of the pictures that were put out on Twitter and Facebook of the residencies. But I think that for residents, maternity and paternity leave has to be something that we think about on the higher order. And that we incorporate into an options-based solution that also is alongside with the educational solutions that we think are important for our learners. So here's a question. What do you think would be great that you would have known earlier in your career? And what can you impart to female residents and young faculty? So I tell this to both genders, but I think that for women, it only becomes a more important conversation because of the mandatory limitations on our gendered fertility and mandatory necessity to be the bearers of children a lot of times. The first decision you make in your career isn't the last decision you make. And every decision is not the only decision. 
So if you choose to spend a period of time working in the ER and only showing up to your shifts, taking care of patients, and then going home and taking care of your family, and that means giving birth to your child, spending some time with your husband, doing dinner or whatever you want to do, and that goes for men and women, that's okay. You can turn around two, three years later and say, I'm ready to come back to academics. I'm ready to do some research. I'm ready to be out of the house a little bit more. My flexibility is a little bit less important. And we need to give permission for our faculty to do that as well. We need to accept a better ebb and flow in and out of the traditional academic sense in order to create a a space where people can be free to be true to who they want all the time. We don't have to make unilateral decisions all the time. I mean, we're emergency medicine doctors. Like we were created for optionality and the best careers I've seen have started at, you know, age 35 or 40 or 50. It's all about being there and being dedicated and doing it when it's right for you. So along kind of the same vein, in terms of negotiating contracts, what advice do you have for women earlier in their careers or even just changing careers? There's all this good evidence that women don't ask, that we're really bad at salary negotiation and that we're really bad at, at, at standing up for what we want. And I think there's definitely some truth to that. I think that we are not adversarial. I mean, and if you look at the worst gendered relationship I have, so mine and my husband, and he is a negotiator for a living. But the way he negotiates makes me uncomfortable. Like, it's not even like I want to emulate it. I hate it. Because we're talking about our contractors. We're talking about negotiating with our children, right? He will go to the nth degree and he will fight to the death and say, I will not give up my stance. And he wins because everyone else backs down. So I don't pretend to think that that's a solution that everybody should accomplish. I don't think that we need to negotiate like other people. We need to be truer to standing up for what we believe in. And the problem for us is until we create a space where the solutions we need to find are not only academic. So why are we bad negotiators? It's because we have many more things a lot of the time to solve. So we're not only talking about money. We're talking about our schedule. We're talking about our flexibility. We're talking about our out-of-work requirements. And so I think that for women who are going into the workplace, they need to look critically at the other factors that they're letting bleed into their own negotiation tactics and say, how many of those have to be negotiated Do I really need to negotiate a fixed schedule right now or can I advocate for my own salary and then six months from now when I really need a fixed schedule, bring that to the table? Because this is where if you go back to Sheryl Sandberg's podcast or I guess her TED Talk wasn't a podcast and then the book that she wrote, Don't Leave Before You Leave. And women do that. We do that because we are planners and we have all this on our shoulders and we need to make sure that everything is taken care of way before it's even an issue. And those are the best employees. The women that do that are the ones that we want to be like because they're the ones that don't make their problems someone else's. The qualities that we think make us really good employees are also what makes us really bad negotiators. And so my advice for women who are negotiating is negotiate one thing at a time. And sometimes it's okay to advocate for more money. Ask other people what they're earning. One of the things we did at Feminem around this was actually create a job board. And we did it because, yes, it gives us a little bit of revenue and full disclosure, but We did it because we wanted there to be more transparency around the workplace for women. And the reason why the job board is cool is because you can search on Feminem for articles that employers have written as sponsored content or that have been written about employers um, when you're comparing job to job. So if you're looking at two different community hospital sites and you put in the name of the site and then you pull up their maternity leave program, you don't then have to say to the employer when you're negotiating, what is your maternity leave program, which automatically changes your negotiation status. So the more information we can make open access, the less questions we have to ask when we're negotiating our deal, the better off we're going to be as employees. And that's kind of what I want for women in the future is you have to fight less of the total fight at once because that's what men have been doing for generations. Yeah, that's really great advice. So why do we need to recognize women in emergency medicine? In your opinion, why do organizations like FEM and EM need to exist? So again, I think that the reason why Feminem has to exist specifically is because of its impartiality to a governing organization. And we've been able to do things that are a little cooler that other people wouldn't be able to do things like advocating for women's health or other kind of more interesting and kind of political at this landscape roles that affect things like child care and maternity leave and stuff like that. Why do we need to recognize women in emergency medicine? Well, the way that I put this is that it's like the same thing. Why do women have to be on a panel or why do we have to include women in any job search for a chair, like tokenism, right? People are very concerned about tokenism when it comes to women. I don't want to change the rules. I want to have the most qualified candidates on the table. That's great, but there hasn't been equal access to the resources and opportunities before that panel was generated. 
So a lot of why we need to have this, why feminism has to exist, why we have to pay attention to things like diversity and inclusion and not only related to women is because the setup for the opportunity isn't equal. And so it's about neutralizing those opportunities and compensating for their existence, not creating tokenism and giving people specific advantages. And so that's really, I think, why it will have to exist for a period of time, a long, long, long period of time. Great. So what are your future goals for feminism? To not need to be existing. Yeah. (laughs) That's the goal of any advocacy group is to have its total existence be unnecessary. I think that for the next five years, our goal is to bring together in a unionized way the women of emergency medicine. And I think that not in an adversarial way, but in a really collective kind of journey way. We're having our first conference in October, which I think is going to be incredible. It's about the journey of women physicians and giving everyone a voice, but it's very much about the different experiences that women have had. And we had an incredible number of women submit to speak, which is not what you expect. So we know that women don't speak, that we had an article that came out last month that said that 27% of Grand Round speakers are women across the board. We know that we started the Feminine Speakers Bureau to address that, and it's been incredible. We have 180 women speakers on there right now. I told a guy in a different specialty that we had 180 women on the Speakers Bureau, and he thought that's how many women we had in Feminine. And I was like, well, we have every woman in Feminine because it's not a membership organization. And he couldn't believe that 180 women in any specialty would have volunteered to speak on stage. And it goes to show that if you build it, they will come. So you want it to be an environment that people will feel welcome and empowered. And our conference had so many offers to speak that we changed the entire algorithm of the speaking options and made the talk shorter and many, many more speakers. And so I think that we we want to continue to think of ways that we can inspire women, that we can create a landscape for lots of conversations and to recognize again, and this is a conversation that I have all the time, it's not about telling people how to live their lives. We do not want to say that there's one right way to be a physician, to be a professional, to be a spouse, to be a parent. That's never been it. I have as many friends who have quit their jobs and stayed home with their families who are entirely empowered and feel great about it than ones that have gone and become chairs of departments. That's fantastic. Just let it be your real journey and feel like the options are yours. That's literally all we want. That is great. And lastly, how can residents become involved in feminine? The first thing you can do is you can go to the website, feminem.org, and you can sign up for the newsletter, which we send out every two weeks, just the content that we have and the blog content. The next best way is to write. We love, love, love a diversity of voice. We've had over 150 contributions so far to the site. A lot of our stuff gets picked up by other sites, which is cool. It's a great way to kind of share your journey. And then come to the conference, tweet it out, follow Feminem Tweets on Twitter. Just tag yourself in a picture. Be part of the conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Dara Koss from Feminem for talking to RSA. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast from the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about RSA, please visit our website, www.aaemrsa.org. Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine students and residents.